On today's show, Spencer Dinwiddie is the most important non-star player in the NBA, and I'll tell you why on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked On Mavs Podcast. Don't believe you shouldn't be here. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making Locked On Mavs your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. But the best way you can help us grow the show is to comment anything below. Let us know. Do you think Spencer Dinwiddie is the most important non-star player in the NBA? I'm going to prove it to you. So maybe answer after you've heard my case instead of answering right now. But but let us know. Or who do you think it is? Um, but yeah, we're doing that today. Isaac Harris is off. I gave him the night off because the guy has two little kids and he doesn't need to be doing five day a week podcasts all throughout the summer. The guy's got to get some sleep. So, and he can't wait up for me and my non-kid having ass to try and come back home certain times of the night so sent Isaac Harris home and today we're gonna get into what makes Spencer Dinwiddie so important for the Mavericks I think we've talked about this we've beaten around the bush around him like we we've mentioned him and talked about his importance but not like really nailed it down so I'm gonna nail it down today why Spencer Dinwiddie is so important and then who are the other non like the other most important non-star players in the NBA like Patrick Beverly. I think he is the most important non-star player on the Lakers. If Russell Westbrook is still considered a star, I think you know we can make that case. But Patrick Beverly just got traded to the Lakers, so I'll talk about that a little bit when we get into it because I think it's applicable to this whole conversation about Spencer Dinwiddie. And let's start with him there. The Dallas Mavericks decide to not max Jalen Brunson. They, you know, we've we've gone over this a million times how Jalen Brunson decided not to be part of the Dallas Mavericks anymore, decided to go to the New York Knicks. In doing so, he left and the Mavericks had a replacement, which was good. It's good that they had Spencer Dinwiddie as a replacement because if they did not, then all of a sudden, this is a real problem. The Mavs have a real problem on their hands if if Jalen Brunson left and Dinwiddie was not there. But they do have Spencer Dinwiddie, so that's good. They have Spencer Dinwiddie, and now they have at least up another guard, another guard next to Luka. For years, we lamented on this very podcast, Isaac and I talked about, they need to get another ball handler next to Luka. I feel like that's just a sentence that, that sentence flows out of my mouth so easily because I've said it so often over the years. The Mavs need to get a ball, another ball handler next to Luka. <laughs> like, you can just say it, we just said it so many times. And Jalen Brunson became that guy, and that was awesome. And then they added Spencer Dinwiddie, and having two guys was even better. And so now at least they have one. They have one, but it makes Spencer Dinwiddie so important to the Dallas Mavericks because he can create his own shot, and he can create shots for others. That's two things the Mavericks just don't have in somebody else. They really don't, besides Luka, obviously. They don't have anyone else that can that can do kind of like one, like, like both of those things. Get a shot for yourself. And playmate can get a shot for somebody else. They honestly don't have a single player on the roster that I think that can do that credibly in like a playoff series. But we've talked about Christian Wood, and I think that Christian Wood can create his own shot a little bit more. So I think he's the next guy that sort of can do one of those things and create a shot for himself. But I don't know if you want to rely on it. I think it's going to be a fun thing that happens in some broken plays here and there, but it's not something that you're drawing up. They'll draw up plays for Spence Dinwiddie to get his own shot. That will happen. They're not going to draw up plays for Christian Wood to get his own shot. It'll happen in a broken play situation, flow of the offense, where it, it just so happens that he's, you know, there's nobody between him and the basket, and he can just drive and, and maybe get around somebody or something. But it's not by design. It's going to happen, though. So those two things, Dinwiddie can play make and create a shot for himself. Who else on the team can do that? You're talking like you have to go down the roster. It's like Jaden Hardy can create a shot for himself. He's not going to create a shot for anyone else. Tim Hardaway can kind of create a shot for himself, but he's still reliant on either plays being drawn up for him to to get a ball off of a screen or off of a pin down or whatever. And then, you know, he him getting his own shot with just the ball in his hands. Like, ball in his hands, top of the key. Can you get a bucket, right? Like, that's what we're really talking about. And you wouldn't really ask Christian Wood to do that. He can a little bit, but he, you're not going to ask him to do that. You're not going to ask Hardaway to do that. 
Hardy, not ready yet that we know of. Uh, two-way player Tyler, Tyler Dorsey had a pretty good day with Greece the other day, but I don't think that you're asking him to do that either. Frank Nilakina, no. Like You just go down the roster, and then you realize, oh, dang. If Spencer Dinwiddie is hurt, who runs the second unit? What happens to that bench unit? Greg St. Jean, assistant coach for the Dallas Mavericks, came on this podcast with Isaac, and Isaac asked him, are the Mavericks looking for another ball handler? Do they need a third ball handler to run those second units, to run that? And he said, well, we're going to stagger Luka and Dinwiddie. There, there won't be many uh, situations where one of Luka and Dinwiddie are not on the court. All right, well, what if one of them is hurt? They're not on the court at all. Well, who replaces him then? That's the, that's the issue. And so when we talk about why a ball handler is so important and why we kept waiting for them to add somebody, and they still might, we were waiting for the, all right, let's you know go get Jordan Clarkson or go get you know, somebody else. And even Jordan Clarkson, I, I don't know. But go get one of those guys. Go get somebody. The Goran Dragic thing. It's why some people were so upset about Goran Dragic because the Mavericks need another one of these guys. And so that's what makes Spencer Dinwiddie so important for the Mavericks. His playmaking, the creation of the shot for himself, and then who replaces him. That sometimes matters a lot more than you think. Who replaces him? The next player up. Your war, your wins above replacement, basically. What are your wins above replacement? Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie has a lot. And this, and I'll give credit now. Uh, this whole topic came from yesterday's podcast. I asked people, what's your biggest question for the Dallas Mavericks? And I got a bunch of answers. And some of you guys had some really good questions. And one of them was from 41AV77, who said, Spencer Dinwiddie can swing the Mavs 10 to 15 wins next year. What's another non-star player in any team that can swing 10 to 15 wins? And I started thinking about that question. And I was like, AV, that's a really good question because... I think I don't know if Spencer Dinwiddie can swing 10 to 15 wins. That's a lot. I think Luca swings that. He he creates their floor and their ceiling. And I think their depth creates uh some of their floor as well. Like if Spencer Dinwiddie is out, they can still replace his scoring. But they're not going to be able to replace his shot creation long term. You can get away with it with between Christian Wood and, you know, and Tim Hardaway Jr. stretching those guys out a little bit more, bringing it, you know, Frank Nilkina doing a little bit, Josh Green doing a little bit. Maybe that maybe that's when you break glass in case of emergency for Jaden Hardy. But in a playoff series, can't do it. You can't do those things. Spencer, that's what makes Spencer Dinwiddie so important. In a playoff series, you can't break glass in case of emergency on Jaden Hardy if he's not ready. He now he may become ready by by the end of the season. But at this point, we don't we don't know that, and we don't think that he's going to be at this point. And so that's what makes Spencer Dinwiddie so important for this Dallas Mavericks team. Uh, Alberto also asked the question, who will run the bench unit if either Luca or Dinwiddie gets injured? Great question. I think it's the it's the Greg St. Jean, the assistant coach for the Mavericks. Another thing he said on this podcast was a little bit by committee. They're going to run. They'll probably just throw out Frank Nilakina as the point guard. And he's not, he's going to bring the ball up the court. He's going to dribble. I'm doing my Bob Cousy dribbling with your, your hand, hand flat. <laughs> he's going to dribble the ball up the court. But they're just going to run some motion offense. They're going to run some stuff where you don't necessarily need a guy top of the key, run, pick, and roll, do all that stuff. They don't have anybody else like that if Spencer Dinwiddie or Luka are out. So coming up, let's talk about the other non-important, not not not, not important. We'll talk about the other important non-star players. Who are the most important players that are not stars? Spencer Dinwiddie's not a star. What's a non-star on these other teams? And why is Spencer Dinwiddie the most important one in the NBA? I'll prove that coming up to you coming up. But before we do, let me tell you about Bet Online. It's a good place to go check out some odds, some lines, some stats, some spreads. They have all kinds of stuff. Um, Eurobasket, Luca played the other day against Estonia and had a good game. And you had the Giannis versus Jokic matchup going up against each other. And they have some pretty good stats for that. Odds to win Eurobasket. Serbia, plus 3,500. Slovenia, plus 375. So they're moving Serbia up. They're feeling good about Serbia after that win against Greece. Greece is plus 450, so they're right there. And then France is plus 550. Those are the top four on Bet Online. Serbia is above Slovenia. Just not much, by just 25, just 25 points. That's not very much. So... Maybe wait to put some wagers on Slovenia if you're going to, because that's not a, a great number for them. But you can check out that. You can check out anything else. NBA, they still have WNBA. Our Dallas Wings didn't, didn't move on. But you can put money down on the championship odds right now. The Aces, the odds on favorite to win the championship. So go check it out. It's Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, Isaac, let's continue with our conversation. Spencer Dinwiddie is the most important non-star player in the NBA. He is. 
the most important non-star player. I didn't think it. I didn't think it was right when AV asked this question on the Locked On Maps YouTube comments. But then I started going through it. It's hard to prove that somebody else is the most important non-star player. Let's go through them. Let's start in the Eastern Conference. Um, the Eastern Conference, and I'm just going through playoff teams. I'm leaving out the Hornets, the Wizards, the Pacers, the Pistons, and the Magic. They got too much stuff to figure out. They're, they're not going to play in enough high leverage games in playoffs or in runs to the playoffs to make them to make any of their players important enough, right? Like. If Spencer Dinwiddie is out, it could cost the Mavericks a series, <laughs> a series, a playoff series win. That's a lot. Uh, the Knicks, I was also going to leave out, but I'll just throw, I think Brunson's their most important non-star player, but they also have Emmanuel Quickly and Derrick Rose to replace him. And so then maybe it's just RJ Barrett is their guy. But yeah, I'll, I'll leave them out a little bit too. Let's just go in order of standings last year. The Miami Heat. I think their most important non-star player is Tyler Hero. You can make a case for Kyle Lowry. Is Kyle Lowry a star anymore? I don't think so. He's not going to be an all-star anymore. So maybe he's their most important non-star player. But then you have Tyler Hero to back him up. Then you have Lowry to back up Tyler Hero if he's out, right? So you start talking about what makes him important. Miami can replace either of those guys. Boston, Marcus Smart is their most important non-star player. He was the defensive player of the year. And but they can replace his defense a little bit. Like they can, they can, they can hold out and make up for it. So I don't think he's the most important in the league. Milwaukee, Brooke Lopez is probably their guy. They have three stars in Giannis, Middleton, Drew Holiday. You can cover up a lot with three stars. And so I think it's Brooke Lopez, but I don't think he he rises to the level of most important in the NBA. Sixers, kind of the same thing. They have you know Embiid and Harden as their star players. And then like Tyrese Maxey and Tobias Harris. One of those two guys is the most important non-star player. It's probably Maxey if I had to pick one. I think he's got the most like ceiling that he can still hit he could swing a lot of series or a lot of games for them next year so he's probably but then you just have tobias harris to back him up right like he, he, they have enough depth there at those spots toronto it's fred van vliet by a mile but he's a star so you can't really count him but um but if they don't have him like they didn't they really don't have any more guards like all they all they they don't have centers or guards all they have is these six six to six nine guys and it's all by design but if fred van vliet goes down they're kind of screwed for a little bit um but yeah, they, they have too much depth for anybody else to be considered that. And Fred VanVleet's a star, so it doesn't count. Chicago, it's Caruso and Lonzo. And it's interesting that they have two, but they have two. It's both of those guys. And it's probably Lonzo more than Caruso if you want to just pick one. But the fact that they have two means that you at least have a replacement for one of them. The problem that they ran into last year was that both of those guys were out. And so if they're both the most important player and they're both out, then, then it's hard. And again, this is non-star players. So you're not looking at the stars. I'm not looking at DeRozan, not looking at Levine. Brooklyn, it's Seth Curry. He played the most minutes last year in the playoffs besides Durant and, Ky and Kyrie. Um, you'd still consider Ben Simmons a star, I think. He's made an all-star team. like he's, he's been a star, so I'll still I'll still shoehorn him in as a star, and so it's Seth Curry for them. Uh, but, if they, but if they don't have him, they have three stars. They can replace him, those guys in other ways. Um, Cleveland, I think it's Evan Mobley if he's not a star yet. I don't know if we're putting Evan Mobley in a star situation, but you have Jared Allen. Like they have, they have Kevin Love. They have they have ways to replace it, what he brings uh, in a pinch. You're not talking about for a long term, just in a pinch. Uh, the, the Mavericks do not have a way to replace Spencer Dinwiddie in a pinch if he's out. Atlanta Hawks, the last team in the Eastern Conference. It's Clint Capella. He's the most important non-star player, but they have Aneka Okongwu to, to back him up. And so you start looking at the rest of the guys. Okay, well, DeJounte and Trey Young are both probably stars. Bogdanovich, you're like, okay, but then you have two stars to to like to cover all those things. So, yeah, so with Clint Capella and Okongwu, you have that. So that's the Eastern Conference. If you just look at the Eastern Conference, you try to pick one, it's probably Caruso and Lonzo are the most important to those teams. Because if those two guys are out, their def the, the Bulls' defense falls apart like it did last year. And so those guys are probably the most important, but – just with the fact that there's two of those guys means that they have two, right? And so then they can't be the most important if there's two two on the same team. Let's move over to the Western Conference. I'm leaving out the Kings. Sorry, Kings. I'm leaving out the Jazz. They just have a huge asterisk on them. They've already made a, a big move um, with Gobert and then, then, then now this Patrick Beverly move. The Thunder, the Rockets, and the Spurs. I'm leaving out all those teams. The Blazers are throwing here a little bit as well, and the Lakers all throw in uh, because I think it's Patrick Beverly. Let's go in order. Well, let's go in order of. Uh, let's just go in order of who I think is most interesting. Patrick Beverly. Let's start with him. I think the Lakers' most important non-star player is Patrick Beverly. I would still th think 
Russell Westbrook's a star. Now, he's not a star on the court necessarily anymore. And if you don't think he's a star, if you're saying you're, you're going back to Cuban in what, 2015, 2017, he's not a star player. Okay, well, then it's Russell Westbrook because if he turns around and he turns around his game, then that changes so much for that, that Lakers team. But for all those other factors, I'm out. Uh, but Patrick Beverly is the most important because I think now that they've made this trade, so they trade Stanley Johnson and Taylor Horton Tucker, that whole experiment is over. They, they drafted him. They didn't want to trade him for Kyle Lowry. They gave him that contract. And then he played terribly next to Russell Westbrook and just did, didn't fit at all. And now they bring in Patrick Beverly. I think it's a really good move for the Lakers. It's a, it's a fine move for the Jazz to try and get Taylor Horton Tucker to try and get something out of him. He showed flashes. He's shown a lot of flashes on this Lakers team. Maybe if he doesn't have to play next to Russell Westbrook, he can show some of those flashes again, become more efficient as a player, become more efficient as a scorer, not have so much spotlight on him. Where have we seen that before? <laughs> oh, with D'Angelo Russell and Julius Randle and Brandon, Brandon Ingram and Lonzo Paul, like so many of these Lakers guys come in there and the spotlight is so bright on them. They got all these stars watching them from the sidelines all the time. I think all that stuff just becomes... Uh, overwhelming for them. Like, even think about, for these Lakers guys, the way that they light the court. It, well, this was a big deal back in, you know, back in, like, the forum days or, you know, these, like, you know, the winning time show when it was the 80s Lakers. The, in the Staples Center, what they do is they lower the lights on the crowd. Like, if you're at a Mavericks game, the, the crowd is all lit the whole time. You can see everybody, like, clear as day. But at a Lakers game, they darken the crowd and the lights are all directed and centered right on the court. And so like that spotlight is on you in a way that it's different anywhere else. And you have all those banners, you have all those Lakers, like there's just a lot to them. So maybe Taylor Horton Tucker goes, doesn't have the pressure on him anymore. The LeBron shadow right behind him. It's not even his shadow. It's just actually LeBron just standing behind him all the time. Uh, and so now the Lakers make this move. Patrick Beverly gets brought in. I think it makes the Lakers a little bit better. Um, I'm not, I'm still not worried about them if I'm the Dallas Mavericks. But now, talk, going back to our conversation, Patrick Beverly is the most important non-star player on the Lakers because I think he's their I think he's their best three-point shooter and perimeter defender. <laughs> unless it's LeBron, unless LeBron still is the best perimeter defender, he probably is. But he's probably their best three-point shooter and perimeter defender, Patrick Beverly. <laughs> so good move for them because they needed both of those things badly, badly. They don't have anybody to replace him. It's Austin Reeves, and Austin Reeves is not is neither a good defender or perimeter shooter, which is weird to think about both of those things. That's the Lakers. That's their guy. I think Dinwiddie is still more important than Patrick Beverly, but Beverly's really important to the Lakers now. Let's go in order of um, standings now. Phoenix Suns. I think it's Mikael Bridges, the most important non-star player on their team. If you consider Aiton a star, maybe I'd consider him, but I think Mikael's important. They at least have Cam Johnson to replace him, so he's not the most important in the league, but he's still really important to the Suns. Memphis. This one was kind of tough for me to find one because they just have so many guys. Is Jaron Jackson Jr. a star? I don't think so. So it's probably him, but they're going to replace him for the next, for like the first month of the season anyway, first two months of the season anyway, with Brandon Clark, Steven Adams, go small with Zaire Williams or Jake LaRavia, who they may start anyway. So they have enough guys to replace him. They're not they're not dying without him. The Warriors. I think it's Andrew Wiggins. He's not a star. Are Clay and Draymond still stars? Yeah, I think they are. So yeah, it's Andrew Wiggins. I think. It, but if they don't have Andrew Wiggins, they can replace him. They can replace his production um, in a pinch, in a in, even in a playoff series. Probably not in the finals, like they like they just proved that they couldn't, and maybe in the Western Conference Finals. But in a first round playoff series, sure, they can replace him. Nuggets. This one was tough too. This is a little bit like the this is a little bit like the Bulls one where it's it's Michael Porter Jr. or Aaron Gordon. It's one of those two guys. Is Porter Jr. a star yet? I don't think so. Aaron Gordon's not a star either. So those guys are super important. It's probably Aaron Gordon more than Michael Porter Jr. But Port this is the thing. Aaron Gordon can raise the floor of the Nuggets. Michael Porter Jr. can raise the ceiling. So which one is it? You pick which one you want. What's more important to you? I think Dinway is more important than either of those guys by nature of them having two guys on the list. Quickly through the next couple ones here. Um, Timberwolves. It's D'Angelo Russell pretty easily, but the Wolves have Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Edwards, and Gobert. All of them are stars, so they have enough to cover if D'Angelo Russell is not good enough. Clippers, same kind of situation. They have Reggie Jackson. He's probably their most important 
non-star, but they they're so deep as a team that no nobody else really like they, it's not going to be a big deal if Reggie Jackson misses games. Like like John Wall could replace him in the starting lineup very easily. <laughs> Norman Powell could too. Pelicans, CJ McCollum. I don't think he's a star. He's real close. Like he's real close. He played so well for that Pelicans team last year. But CJ McCollum is the most important non-star player, but they have Devontae Graham. He at least can replace him. That's better than what the Mavericks have to replace Dinwiddie, if you're just going to put it like that. And then the Blazers. This is the one that really made me think. Because I think it's Anthony Simons. As far as most important non-star player. I just keep repeating that because I just want to nail that down. I think he's the most important. Because you have Dame Lillard. And you know what he's going to bring. But you got to get something else. You got to get another punch. Is it coming from Jeremy Grant? Is it coming from Gary Payton? No. Is it coming from Josh Hart? Is it coming from, you know, some of their other guys? Like, it's, is it coming from Nurkic? I don't think that extra scoring punch is coming from those guys. Maybe Jeremy Grant. But not the shot creation yourself. Not the, you know, I need a bucket. I'm giving I'm giving him the ball. And the Blazers don't really have a way to replace Anthony Simons. So it's maybe Anthony Simons. But I'll, I'll argue the Blazers don't have as much at stake as the Mavericks. The Mavericks are better than the Blazers. The Mavericks went farther in the playoffs last year. The Mavericks have lost more on their team than the Blazers did. And so I think that if you're just talking about leverage and most important, Spencer Dinwiddie is more important than Simons. So I just went to the Mavericks than Simons is to the Blazers. So I just went for next season. So I just went through the entire NBA, the most important, and I think it's still Spencer Dinwiddie. So coming up, let's talk about why that's a problem and when, what the Mavericks can do um, to sort of help Spencer Dinwiddie and help Luka Doncic because they're going to have a lot on their they're going to have a lot on their uh, uh, plates next year. So let's talk about that coming up. All right, Isaac, let's continue our conversation. Spencer Dinwiddie is the most important non-star player. So I made the case. I talked about why Spencer Dinwiddie is important. He play makes. He creates shot for himself. No one can replace him on the Mavericks currently right now unless they get somebody else. And I went through the entire NBA. And talked about each individual team. Who's the most important non-star player on each of these teams? And there's not many that come up where it's a real high leverage situation where they just don't have anybody to replace what that player does. So Spencer Dinwiddie is super important for the Dallas Mavericks. What's he going to bring next year? I'm fascinated to see what how he's going to approach it. Because he's going to be empowered. Jason Kidd is going to empower Spencer Dinwiddie the same way he empowered Jalen Brunson. And Dinwiddie may be more ready for that than Jalen Brunson was. He's older. He's been in the NBA longer. He's been in the situation in the NBA before. Now, Jalen Brunson had been in this situation where he was asked to do a lot in college, in high school, his whole career. So he had been asked it a lot. Dinwiddie had a different path. Dinwiddie was a, like a, what was he? A, he was a second round pick. Second round pick, 38th overall in 2014 draft. And then... He played 34 games for the Pistons that first year, 12 games the next year. I think he had some I think he had an injury in at least one of those years. But he had to work his way. He had to work his way into the role. He only played 13 minutes a game in the in the minute in the games that he did play, and so he had to work his way. He had to work his way into this. He had to work his way into the NBA. Brunson had to do the same thing. But he had to work his way. And then he then he goes to Brooklyn. He has that season where he's like Real close, like four spots away from being an all-star, which I guess sounds really far now if you put it that way. But he got up there. He averaged 20 points a game. He played 64 games for that 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 Brooklyn team that made the playoffs. He was just really good for them. He was so important for that team. Um, Jared Dudley was on that team, and so he's he's got he's got some players next to him, or he's got some some people that are going to be in his corner, and Jared Dudley and uh, Jason Kidd. And Jason Kidd's going to empower him the same way that he empowered Jalen Brunson. And so how will Spencer Dinwiddie come into the season? Will he come into the season ready to go? Ready to lead? Ready to like be aggressive? Because we did not see Spencer Dinwiddie aggressive all the time in certain situations. He was still trying to feel it out. He only played 23 games last year for the Mavs. And then 18 games in the playoffs. <laughs> like He played almost the same amount of games in the playoffs that he did in the regular season for the Mavs. That's weird. That's jarring for him. Took 10 and a half shots a game in the playoffs. He took um, 10 and a half shots a game in the regular season. He's going to have to up that. He's going to have to take more than that. They're going to ask him to do a little bit more. And so how is he going to respond to that? Because he is the most important non-star player in the NBA. 
He just is. All right. I got a couple minutes left here, and I don't do this often, but Isaac is gone. So let me let me give you like my my five minutes on Dallas Wings. Um, because I've I have was season ticket holder this year. I've followed them all year. And I think that they're in a really interesting situation. Some of you are interested in this, some of you are not, and that's fine. But I think that they're just in a fascinating situation. The Dallas, the Dallas Wings have an Arike Agumba Wale problem. Because I think they play better without her. It's tough. But I think even Vicky Johnson knows it, the coach of the, of the Wings, because Arike was available to play and she didn't start. Now, maybe it's because of how bad her injury was. Arike is the, you know, the star player for the Wings. She's been to two, she's two All-Stars appearances, which is hard in the WNBA. You got, you know, only so many players and only so many spots. Uh, 12 players per team. There's only 12 teams. And so to be an All-Star, you got to be the best of the best, like, like high up there. And so Arike was that twice. And she's led the WNBA in scoring. If I had to explain her game to somebody that doesn't watch the WNBA, I would say, and I've said this to other people, that she is James Harden without the playmaking. <laughs> she can score, and she can score buckets. She gets streaky, and she can, and when she gets hot, it's over. It's literally over for other teams, and that's what makes her so intriguing. But then she can shoot you out of games, too. She can really shoot you out of games at times. And so Arike <laughs> plays on this team. This, this Dallas Wings team has a bunch of players. They they've they had 10 players this year average 12 minutes a game and play more than 10 games. That's a lot. They only have 10-minute quarters in the WNBA, so 12 minutes a game is a lot. That's like multiple different rotations. That's like multiple shifts that they're playing. And they didn't really have any season-long injuries besides Satu Sabli, who was in and out of the lineup here and there. They're the only team in the WNBA to have 10 players play 12 or more minutes a game and play more than 10 games and not have like a season long ending injury or a trade where they sent somebody away. They just played a lot of different players. They, they're just, there's a, a weirdly deep team that just doesn't have enough up top. And the, the player that should be up top is Arike. And it was just hard at certain points of the season to look at a team and say, okay, well, they're playing so well without her. And then she comes back from injury and she, she just, she wasn't right. It, it, you know, you can't really hold that part against her, but we saw it before. And so I'm really interested to see what they're going to do with Arike. She's the star. She draws still a crowd there. When she came back into the game, the the response from the crowd was kind of like timid. It was like, should we be excited about this? First, because of her injury. And second, because of the way the Wings play without her. And so that's going to be fascinating to see how they react to that. Alicia Gray has had, had a really interesting season this year. She's one of the best defenders as a guard in the WNBA. And... She's really important for the Wings. She, to me, I, I've explained it like this. Um, if you're a Mavs fan, which if you listen to this, you are. But um, she is like the Jalen Brunson of the of the Wings. And she's been with the Wings since she started in the, the, the WNBA. She's been with the Wings for a while. And then Kayla Thornton is like the Dorian Finney-Smith. They play kind of the same. And they've been with the, the, you know, the Wings their whole career. Alicia Gray doesn't play exactly like Jalen Brunson. It's a little different. She, she can score. She doesn't as much. She averages like 13 points a game, which is pretty high in the WNBA. That's probably like an you know an 18 to 20 point per game average in the in the NBA if you just are considering it like that. Um, but she defends really well. She can get a bucket. She's won a gold medal in three on three in the in the Olympics. Like she can get her own shot for sure. But she doesn't. She doesn't. Like in the in the in the, in the playoffs, they really needed her to step up to do what Jalen Brunson did for the Dallas Mavericks, and and she just didn't really step up to the plate. Because of coaching, because of the, how many players, like I mentioned how many players that they had to play in their rotation. And so I was really just waiting for her to like, all right, take over. Take over right now. And Alicia Gray didn't do it. Marina Mabry did. Marina Mabry came in and she was the one that really took over. She was the one that was forcing shots up. She was the one that was the offense that replaced the the Arike Agumbawale void when the Dallas Wings didn't have somebody, when Arike was out. And it was Marina Mabry really doing that and really just filled the vacuum of, of that scoring. And Alicia Gray didn't. And I was looking for her to be a little bit more aggressive and to see. And so now I bring this all up because she's the only free agent on the roster, according to the cap sheets that I've checked. She's the only free agent. And so they really have to figure out what they're going to do with her um, and what she's going to do. She could leave. She could leave to go find a, a, bit, a better situation where she's going to get more shine, more love, more op, more opportunity. But I think she had more opportunity, and I'm not sure she took it. 
I'm not I'm not in the huddles. I'm very close to the huddles with the seats that I have, but I, I didn't get to see exactly everything. I could see some frustration here and there, but I, I'm not sure that she really um, that she really stepped up and became like the uh, you know the scorer that like the team leading scorer that I expected her when Enrique Agumbawale went down. Then there's Vicky Johnson. Vicky John- Johnson, the coach of the Dallas Wings. They've improved every year that she's been the coach. But I think she might be on thin ice. I'm really interested to see what this team does with Vicky Johnson. I think she's lost the locker room because their players, you know, Izzy Harrison, even Alicia Gray, others that have come out and have not been uh, <laughs> complimentary of Vicky Johnson and her rotations. And I think part of playing all those players that I mentioned before is because she couldn't decide what the rotation was, even in the playoffs. That last playoff game, she was just trying stuff because she didn't know what rotation she wanted to go with. Now, she was faced with injuries and there's a bunch of different situations she was dealt with. She was dealt with a roster that just had so many parts that you had to put together in a certain way, and she's never really found the right groove for it, I don't think. And so is that enough of a pass to keep your job next year, or did you not get enough out of this roster that maybe you could have? Because it is a deep team. Got a lot of good players. The Dallas Wings started a game in, in the playoffs and were playing neck and neck with the, the Connecticut Sun, who could very easily win the WNBA championship. But they started with their three best players going into the season on the bench. <laughs> uh, between Tierra McCowan, who was a player of the week this, this past season, and at times has been one of their best players. Arike and Satu were, were coming back from injury. So they were on the bench. And like you had all these, guys, all these players starting that were not necessarily their best players, and you got there. So what do you count it as? It's so hard. Do the injuries and the... You know, weird roster situation. Does that give you enough of a pass? Or does Greg Bibb, the GM and the president of the Wings, just look at it and say, that's not enough. You didn't do enough with the players that we had. We had a deep roster. We had enough players. You should have been better, especially times in the regular season. I don't know if you hold the playoffs against her, but I think you hold some of the regular season moments against her rotations and like and whatnot. Last thing. Veronica Burton was been my most interesting player all year. She's a rookie. She was drafted out of Northwestern. And when she first played, I didn't know much about her. I knew I had heard that she was really good defensively. The offense was going to come, but she's like a good floor general. And I was just really interested to see how she was going to play. And she got a little bit of run early, and you could just tell the defense was game changing from game one. I was at their first game, their opening night against the, the Atlanta Dream, and I could tell her defense was just different, as a, especially as a rookie coming in. Her defense is different. She's basically Marcus Smart on defense. She just disrupts so much stuff. She creates turnover. She had a turnover in the playoff game the other night where she just ripped the ball away from another, like, from the sun. Like, just grabbed the ball and ripped it away. It was like a Kawhi move. Her defense is just game-changing, and it, she worked her way up into, like, 30 minutes a game starting for the wings. Now, Arike was out. Satu was out. That that really helped her get that role, but she worked into that. She worked right into that role, was given that role. She was playing over 20 minutes a night uh, for a lot of the rest of the season. The hard part was the offense just wasn't there. Early in the season, turnovers just all the time. Turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. W- was timid to shoot shots, would miss, miss a bunch of threes. Um, she's only taken like one or two a game, so it's hard to get in a rhythm there. And then later in the season, it started to come along. Later in the season, she started to have some games where she would score 15 points. Like Just start with like seven points, five points, like eight points. But then she got to like 15 points, 11 points, and then had um, – the playoff game the other night, she scored 10 points, had four assists. And like that's so she had a couple of and ones where she was driving the lane, like being aggressive and her offense just kind of blossomed. And so I'm really interested to see what her next season is going to look like with the wings. Does she start as a starter? I think she should just because of her defense, because between Veronica Burton, Alicia Gray and Kayla Thornton, and then throw in Tierra McCowan that those players defending created what made the wings good. And so, all right. I want more than five minutes, but I just wanted to go over that. That's the Dallas Wings out of this playoff run and now into the offseason. And uh, they won't play again until May, so it's a long offseason for them. But they got some things to do. They got some things to figure out. There you go. That's enough from us from, from the Lockdown Maps this week. We'll be back on Monday talking news and notes. Isaac will be back, and we'll break it all down for you there. Guys, thanks so much for listening to Lockdown Maps. Peace out. Boom!